Okay, hello and welcome to another lecture of W102. You know, just some quick announcements. The third homework is once again due this Friday. Uh, there have been some questions about regrades. For regrades of homework one, or if you cannot access the solutions that have been posted, please email the graders or the TA, okay? If you don't have the grader's email, just directly email the TA and they'll connect you with the grader for any questions about regrades or why you got uh, some questions wrong. Okay, in this lecture, we're going to, it's gonna be a little bit of a repetitive lecture. We're going to sort of talk in more detail about convolution and in particular, we'll try to get both a gist, like an intuitive gist of convolution, a mathematical gist, and finally an applications gist, so we can understand the importance of convolution holistically. So convolution, just interestingly uh, enough, convolution in English, if you just look up the English di dictionary, basically means confusing. And lawmakers often use convolutions to describe very complicated bills that are passed in the House for the Congress. They'll say that this bill has a lot of convolutions to it. So convolution in English might refer to confusing, but in double E, it's maybe the most important operation. And as we discussed in the last lecture, the reason convolution is really important is because it adds structure to the black box. In particular, remember that this black box system, I have some signal X, right? Some signal X here that goes in to a system S and then gives you an output Y. This is the most basic description of any type of machine in the world, right? Any type of machine will take an input, mathematical signal, crunch the data, and then give you an output. So this is a very general definition that applies to a lot of systems. However, if I just pose it in this way, X goes into block diagram, S gives me output Y, it's not really that descriptive, right? I don't actually know how X and Y are related. So the key here is that if the system S is LTI, if the system is linear and time invariant, then convolution, So if LTI, then convolution relates the mapping from X to Y. So this is a very profound result. It tells us that we can calculate the output just from convolution given this very general box as long as the system S is LTI. Okay. Now, in the last lecture, we actually derived why this worked, okay? So we're going to repeat that derivation again with some additional context. And this derivation you'll see shows up in other classes at UCLA, even in grad classes, albeit in different forms. So let's look at the last slide. So we have some system S that operates on a signal X to give you Y. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna rewrite this system in more simple terms as H. So just for now, we will rewrite, and this is with lo with, with, without loss of generality. Let me just say that X goes into a black box H to give me Y, right? I've just changed the label of the system from a capital S to a capital H. As we go through the derivations, some of you will see why I did that, but if you don't catch on it, don't worry about it because it's just nomenclature. So if this is uh, how I represent my system, then clearly y of t is also equal to h of x of t. Again, I'm not really saying anything profound. I'm just saying that my output is some operation h that is applied to my input x of t. So nothing here should be special. 
However, we come now to something that is special, where we take our system H and we substitute in from the last lecture a new expression that we had for x of t. So remember that from the last lecture, we showed that we can write x of t in terms of a summation of shifted delta functions. So that looks something like this. Infinity. All right, so all I've done is I've substituted this x of t for the integral form of the deltas, right? And we learned that in the last lecture. So now that I have this form, I can now exploit the fact that my system is LTI. So if my system is LTI, then what I can do is I can actually apply linearity. So apply linearity. And what that's going to give me is it's going to give me a new system. So if it's linear, remember that I can actually move the h around. So I can actually put the h inside the integral. All right. So now I have the h inside the integral thanks to the property of linearity because the system is linear. And now some of you will see why we have used the notation h. Because what I can now do is I can apply excuse me, time invariance, not space. I can now apply time invariance okay and so this what this is saying is that if h here in the purple, right, this h here is applied to a delta. That's telling me that if I put a delta into the system called h, it's what, what is the output, right? That's what this operation is saying. What is the output if the input to h is a delta? Well, this is nothing but the impulse response if the signal is time invariant, okay? If the signal is time invariant, then this is nothing but the impulse response. And so now I can write this as actually just a signal, which is lowercase h of t minus tau. So I've removed the system from this expression, this abstract black box system, and characterized the system by this very special function known as the impulse response. So the impulse response has replaced this very general kind of uh, capital H on a signal, which could mean anything ordinarily. Okay. So now this form in the orange, is actually what we call as the convolution. So convolution is nothing but saying that the output of a system, y of t, remember what, all of these are y of t. When I write an equals without something to the left-hand side, we assume that this kind of is carried over, right? All of these on the left-hand side are y of t's. y of t equals, so y of t was up here, and now that equals down here. What's down here? So that's going to be the integral from minus infinity to infinity of x of tau, h of t minus tau, d tau. And this is known as the convolution integral. And so what this does is it tells me if I have an x going into some system, h, it will give me an output y, right? And that's described by this integral form here, which is something that we call convolution. Now, now that we've established that if I have a, a black box system that happens to be LTI, I pop in any signal x, 
I can relate x to the output by just doing a convolution with the impulse response. Let's think about some practical systems to get a gist of this. Um, as you graduate from school and work in industry or work in graduate classes, you don't actually end up really memorizing or computing this integral very often. You just sort of feel it in your bones and you kind of know what the input and output is because this is so common in a lot of systems. So let's think about some examples to get a gist of convolution. The word I use here is smearing. Convolution is an operation that is related to a smearing in time or a blurring or streaks in time. A lot of real world physical systems cause these sort of streaky effects in time. What do I mean? Well, let's say that I'm trying to uh, turn on my heater in my house. So believe it or not, it was a pretty cold day today uh, out in California. So I have this heater and what my input is to the system is the time at which I go and flip the switch to turn the heater on. So the heater in my house is off. Maybe, you know, here is midnight, so zero, zero, if we're using like 24 hour time. And I wake up at 8 a.m. And as soon as I wake up, I turn on the heater, all right? Now, that switch goes to some sort of control circuit, which goes to, uh, you know, the heat pump, the gas heater, it starts, I don't know how my heater works, but let's just say it burns coal or whatever. I have no clue how it works, but something needs to heat up and that has a time constant. So it goes into some system. We'll just call this H for the moment. You can also think of it as S, the, 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 the sort of name of the system is not super critical, but afterwards I get an output, right? And this might be the temperature in my house. This is the temperature. And uh, what I might see is that at here it's at the baseline, whatever the baseline is when I don't have the heater on in my house. Here we have 8 a.m. But it's not like the, heat, the temperature is immediately going to go up like this, right? It, it just doesn't. So what, what, what might actually happen is that this heater, let's pretend that this heater, what it does is it takes an hour to heat up. So here's 9 a.m. What the heater does is it takes an hour to heat up and then it shuts off. So the temperature in my house might go up like this. It heats up to the set point, And then after nine o'clock, it gradually goes down, okay? It gradually goes down with some sort of decay like this. Oops. So 8 a.m. I flip the switch. Temperature gradually increases, and then it kind of drops. Maybe I open the window or whatever, but that's what the heater does. Okay. So now the, the input to the system was a spike, but the output to the system was this kind of like ramp function that kind of decays, right? So what this is, is this is actually a smearing of the spike. Okay. So this is one example is the heater. Now the cool thing about this is I can exactly model uh, what this would be like if maybe, you know, I turn on the heater at eight o'clock, uh, it heats up while I'm eating breakfast up until nine o'clock. And although I can't really do this in quarantine time, let's say I go out for the rest of the day. Uh, let's pretend that I could do that. Uh, let's live in that fantasy land. So I go out for the rest of the day and then I come back in the evening to eat dinner at maybe 1800 hours. And once again, my house is cold because the heater has turned off while I've been out of the house. And so I need to flick it back on. So I apply the same control input, which is another Dirac Delta function. Okay. And what's gonna happen is I can tell you exactly, since the system is time invariant, what the output is gonna look like. I can tell you that at 1600 hours, I'm gonna see the same thing. I'm gonna see this kind of like ramp up to the set point and then a decay down. Okay. And by 1700, I'll be ready for bed. And uh, so this is, sorry, 1800. And so by 1900, I'll be ready in my bed clothes and the heater will be back to the baseline. So this is uh, kind of a gist, right? You can see that now these two spikes have been smeared into two kind of hills, right? One hill here, one hill here, and these hills should be equal. And these hills are actually the impulse response. They're the impulse response to a single spike. So H of T is gonna look something like this. 
Now, it turns out that this sort of principle doesn't just underpin heaters, but it underpins almost every type of input, right? Imagine that you're changing, uh, uh, let me give you an example. Let's say you are uh, giving a, what would be a good example here? All right, I'll give you an example from my own work. Uh, when I was uh, back in graduate school, one of the projects I worked on was LIDAR. So LIDAR would work in a very similar way. You know, this is a LIDAR that was being done for some autonomous cars. And the way that it would work is that we would send out a pulse at some time t, right? And then it would go into a system, h, and then it would give an output. And let's just draw our outputs in red. Right? So, so give me an output. And the output would be another time signal. And ideally, it would be a shifted version of this. Okay. Uh, instead of t, I would see this at t minus tau. Or I would see this at some time. If I sent this at, let's pretend I sent the spike just to make this easier, at t equals zero. If I send a spike here at t equals zero, goes into my system, and then it comes back at some time t1, I receive the signal, the same spike. So in this case, the impulse response is gonna be a delayed version of a spike. Now, what often used to happen is, uh, what would often happen is that in fog, let's say LIDAR in fog, you have, you send the light from the car. This is your car. And as you send the light, there's some fog. So you have scattered light that comes back from the scene. And so you have multiple time returns that come back at different time slots. And so you might actually see some sort of like, you see this primary spike, but then there's like an exponential decay that corresponds to different bounces of scattered light. Right? So now if you look at your LIDAR, you would take this initial spike and you would smear it like this. And this is what you would actually get, just like our heater example. Um, there are numerous examples like this. In neuroscience, for example, if I'm stimulating neurons, I might send a spike to the neuron to fire. There's a technique, if you're interested in bioengineering, called optogenetics, it's a fascinating technique. And they call this, this is invented you know, very recently, maybe in the last 10 years, and people are calling this uh, the next Nobel Prize in biology. And basically what it does is intuitive, really informally, it's like mind control uh, for the brain. Basically they take these lasers and they fire them at the brains of rats and they can actually uh, modify the genetic structure of rats that such that their brains are light sensitive. So meaning if I shine light on a neuron in a rat, that neuron will fire. So I could essentially shine this pattern of rats and make them twitch their left arm, twitch their right arm, and so on. So uh, in this particular example, the firing pattern of the spike, right? The, the spike that I'm sending is again, the input to my system is gonna be a spike. It's gonna be a clean spike at the speed of light, right? I'm gonna use this high power laser that sends, sends a nanosecond pulse, which is like, like a Dirac. Then it hits the neuron and the neuron has these slower synaptic chemical reactions that happen. These chemical reactions require neurotransmitter chemicals to uh, you know, diffuse around the synaptic terminal, right? The axon, all we remember from biology. And that process has a time constant that is much longer than the speed of light. So with respect to the speed of light, you're gonna see that the neuron is actually gonna kind of smear its output response. Okay. And so this is another example of a system that can be modeled by convolution. There are many such examples. I can just you know, pop them off right now. A speeding car uh, you know, going past a traffic light camera, if the car is moving fast, you're gonna see motion blur. That's effectively convolution again. It's a smearing of, uh, of the car. And because of that, you can't make out the license plate of the car and you can't track that car potentially. So there are numerous examples of convolution and one way to get the gist of it is it's kind of like a smearing operation. We will talk for the remainder of the lecture about very mathematical ways to compute convolution, 
But as soon as you get a sense of the smearing, you kind of know that if, I, if my impulse response is like fat, if I put a narrow response into the system, but my impulse response is fatter, as in these two examples, I'm gonna get a fatter output. And where this becomes also an issue, just as an FYI, is when I try to put rapid input, we'll discuss a bandwidth example, if I try to put two rapid pulses together. Like if I go and uh, send two pulses of light at the same time, or nearly at the same time, uh, slightly offset, their impulse response are gonna blur together and you'll get like an addition of these two kernels, which might look something like, you know, kind of weird addition like that. So you, you'll get some very, very interesting outputs uh, with convolution. Okay. So um, now let's move on to examples of computing the impulse response. So I'm gonna start with an LTI system. So let me start with an LTI system like this. Y of T equals integral minus infinity to T of X of tau D tau. And I'm gonna tell you that this is an LTI system and you can calculate offline to verify that this is indeed the case. So now I have an LTI system. And so the question that I might ask is, what is the impulse response? H of T of the system. So this is a slightly different question from what we discussed on the previous slide. Now I'm telling you what the relationship between X and Y is, and I want you to tell me what that in-between block is, right? What, what describes that lowercase h. So uh, one way to think of it is if I'm given this form of equation right here, how do I get the impulse response? Well, let's just read this literally. Impulse response. It's the response of the system to an impulse. So what we can do is we can set x of t to equal delta of t. Okay. And then we simply need to calculate the output. So in this particular case, if I calculate the output y of t, this output is actually going to be h of t. Why? Because y of t y of t is equal to h of t by definition when the input x of t is delta of t. Okay, so now it just becomes a plug and chug problem. If you understand this goal here, you have solved 90% of the battle. To calculate the impulse response, simply set the input equal to the impulse function. Okay, very good. So now what we can do is we can just do plug and chug. plug and chug. So what we do is we take h of t, we set that equal to the integral from minus infinity to t of delta of tau d tau. And remember from our previous lecture that the integral of a delta function is simply equal to the step function u of t. So now I can say that in terms of the convolution integral, y of t. So I can rewrite, I don't need to use this definition of y of t, even though it was provided for me here, I don't need to use it because equivalently, since my system is LTI, I can also calculate y of t another way. I don't need it to be given to me because I can simply, if I know the impulse response, I could simply do a convolution uh, with the impulse response and an arbitrary input. So y of t, 
I can rederive y of t in a different way, okay, as the integral of minus infinity to infinity of x of tau times the impulse response, right? What was the impulse response? Well, the impulse response is right here. It's u of t. So now this would be u of t minus tau d tau, okay? And this turns out is actually equal to minus infinity to infinity, uh, minus infinity to t of x of tau u of t minus tau d tau. So please, uh, if you have a moment, as a CYU question, please see if you can pause the video and try to see why I got from this blue equation here to this magenta equation on the bottom. You can see that the only difference between the two equations is the limit of the integrals. So why is that equal? Uh, why is that limit equal? Okay. So feel free to pause the video and then rejoin us. Okay, so it turns out that in this particular case, if we remember our definition of the Hebeside step function, we can actually remember that we can simplify u of t minus tau as being equal to zero if tau is greater than t. Okay. So if that's the case, then we don't need to integrate all the way up to infinity. We only need to integrate up to t, and we're going to get the same result. All right, here's another example. Suppose I give you y of t is equal to x of t minus tau, and I tell you that this is a LTI system. So this is, just to be clear, this is a new question. All of this is a previous question. So let's say I give you another question where y of t equals x of t minus tau. And please excuse me, but I will actually make a new page just so it's more clear. We'll run out of space. So I hit this key and hold here, add page. Awesome. So as a CYU question, building upon the last example, check your understanding. Now I'm going to give you a new example of a system. I'm going to give you y of t equals x of t minus some delay tau prime. So my output is going to be uh, the original input x, but it's been delayed by some amount tau prime. The question is please calculate what the impulse response should be and rewrite y in terms of the comp integral, okay? Uh, before you pause the video, let me just go back to the previous question. It's exactly like this question over here, right? It's exactly like the same question here you're going to follow the same steps. And if we look at this, when we rewrite in terms of the convolution integral, this expression here in magenta is actually the exact same as the one here. It may look a little different because you have the step function there. But if you remember your definition of a step function, the step function is one as long as the arguments are positive. So you should see that this actually simplifies to the same expression for y of t. OK, feel free to pause the video and go ahead and try to attempt this question.
Okay, so I'm going to put the answer here. Welcome back. In this particular case, what we do to the system is we replace x with a delta. Okay, so if we replace x with a delta, replace x of t with delta of t and calculate the output. So this output is y of t equals h of t equals delta of t minus tau prime. Okay. All we do is we replace x with delta, and that was pretty easy to get, right? It was pretty easy to calculate the impulse response. So hopefully most of you got this part right. Now, uh, this second part was a little bit tricky. Here you want to rewrite the convolutional, in a, you want to rewrite your output of the system y of t in terms of the convolutional integral. Okay. And just to be clear here, I also want to add that this y of t here for specific input of a delta, for delta as input. Okay. So now most of you got up to here. But the second part of this question is asking you to rewrite y in terms of the convolutional integral. So let's begin. y of t is going to equal the integral from minus infinity to infinity of essentially x of tau and then h. Let's just go back to our convolutional integral. Right? Remember, our convolutional integral is h of t minus tau. So this is h of t minus tau, right, d tau. And this equals the integral from minus infinity to infinity of x of tau. Hmm, but let's see here. We have a tau prime in the delta. So how do we represent this? Well, remember that the variable of integration tau uh, that we have in the convolution integral is a protected variable. So in general, Try not to assume that any constant in the original function is equal to tau. In this case, tau prime has no relationship to tau. So we can just treat that as an arbitrary constant. So in this particular case, I can add another shift to the delta function as follows. This is simply the delta of t minus tau prime minus tau d tau. And this is now your expression for the convolutional integral. And you will see if you actually compute this integral, if you actually want to use the sifting property, you'll actually see that this is going to equal, this is going to equal what we had in black, x of t minus tau prime. So this exercise here that you do with the sifting property, feel free to attempt that at home if you want to practice your sifting property. OK, very good. So let's move on to the next slide. Here, we're going to give convolution a special notation. So as I mentioned, convolution is super important. It's like the new operation that you learn in double E. You, you've learned about addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. And remember, we had signs for that, like, like 3 times 4. Well, this is multiplication. Uh, 3 divided by 4, this was division, and so on. Right. So we had these operations and symbols that we learned in our previous education. Now, in double E, uh, convolution gets a special term of notation. So first, let me write the integral form. y of t is going to equal integral from minus infinity to infinity of x of tau times h of t minus tau d tau. Remember, in this case, that x is the input, h is the impulse response, and y is the output. 
So the notation that we use, we have one very rigorous notation to use for convolution, most rigorous. Y of t equals x star, let me just draw this carefully, star h, which is a function, which is a new function of t, right? In reality, nobody writes it this way, except maybe in some academic papers, but people will generally write it as y equals x star h, and everyone will sort of know what you mean, or equally y of t equals x of t star h of t. So uh, as you can see, convolution gets the notation of star. And sometimes uh, this notation has resulted in some confusion in the engineering community because convolution is so common, it gets a notation that we often assign to multiplication. So when people write papers, if you go to look at your keyboard and you hit shift eight, that asterisk there, that's often used in papers for electronic communication for convolution. But as you know, that's also used for multiplication by other people. So there's some kind of collisions in terms of notation between convolution and multiplication, which is another way of underscoring the importance of convolution to say that it's so important that we have used a symbol that we ordinarily use for multiplication. Another way to think of convolution, again, just repeating the first slide, is to think of it in block diagram. We have x of t, and this goes in to some system h of t, and that gives you an output y of t. Now, in this particular case, y of t, as we have mentioned, is related to the system's output, and this is going to be equal to x star h of t, if you want to be rigorous, or just more generally, x of t star h of t. OK. So now we have uh, established the importance of notation. We've gotten some intuition that convolution is smearing. And we have seen uh, some example ways to write convolutions and impulse responses. The next question that may be on your mind is how we actually compute convolution in a general sense. You see, this star operator is very, very far away from multiplication. So how do we actually compute this star operator between some x and some h? And that's what we're going to learn for the remainder of this lecture. It's not easy. Remember that the English for convolution was complicated. So computing this star, uh, you know, even though the star looks very gentle, very innocuous between x and h, there's actually a lot of uh, steps that we need to go through, and it's very time consuming to actually compute a convolution. Okay, so feel free to pause the video and come back multiple times if things don't make sense. Uh, feel free to come to my office hours if you need additional help, but I'm just going to start with this uh, flip and drag method, which is, I think, the easiest way to compute convolutions. So, in general, to calculate the output y, remember y equals x convolved with h, uh, x star h, we have this four-step process. The first step is to flip the impulse response. This changes h of tau to h of minus t. We then begin to drag the reverse time response by some amount t. We multiply pointwise, and then we compute an integral. So this technique taken together is flip and drag. So let's take a look at how this might work with a concrete example. So here I have two generic signals. Here I have some signal x of tau, which is the input. So in reality, I probably had, I've skipped one step here. Really, I would have had an x of t. And if there's no other transformations, I, I can actually just write that, and this is the time axis. I'm also just free to write the same exact signal as x of tau and just relabel this as the tau axis. Okay, so I'm completely free to do that. So you can think of x of tau as the input as a result. So x of tau is the input. That's also equivalent to x of t if you change these symbols from tau to t. 
right? But I've kept it in tau for reasons that will become clear. So now I have an x of tau that is my input. So the axis of this top plot is with respect to tau. This signal is a very simple boxcar function. It's a it's a rect function, and that's the going to be the input to my system. And my system is going to take an input and then also operate on it like a rect function. So here you have your impulse response. All right. So remember that these two are related by an integral transform y of t equals the integral of minus infinity infinity of x of tau h of t minus tau d tau. So that is what we want to calculate. And remember, this is nothing but x star h. So that's what we want to do is we want to compute x star h. So now if we want to compute x, of, uh, x star h, um, what we want to do is we want to get our x and h into a similar form as they are here in this integral, right? So in this case, x is in the form of x of tau. And luckily, I already did that for my input when I just did that swap of variable. So now it becomes clear why I wrote the input in terms of tau, all right? So now we already have this in the requisite form, and there's no work needed there. However, h needs to be in the form of h of t minus tau. And here, I'm given the impulse response in terms of h of tau. So how do I get it in the form of h of t minus tau? Well, as we've learned from the previous lectures and the homeworks, uh, this is simply, if I'm negating the independent variable, then I'm actually going to be computing a flip. So for example, here I have h of tau. I can very easily go from here. So if I'm at h of tau here, I can very easily go to h of minus tau. And all I need to do to compute this, as you may remember from the previous lectures, is I simply go and flip the signal about the axis of x equals 0. So I simply flip around this axis, this axis here. I simply flip the signal around that. And you can see that the boxcar function here, the box function here, has been flipped over here, okay? has been flipped around the axis. So we flipped it around the uh, y-axis. And so now, once we flipped it, remember that we are at h of minus tau. Now we need to also have, our goal is to have h of t minus tau, right? So now we're going to have to attack this challenge of having a t here. So if I want to have a t here, what I need to do is I need to essentially, so this is the, this blue phase is the flip phase. And in green, I have the drag phase. So what I need to do is I need to get this to h of t minus tau, okay? So I need to add t in the input of the function, of the impulse response. So what that is doing effectively is if I drag that by some t, let's say that t, in this particular case, I can kind of look at this signal and I can tell you what t is approximately. So those of you who are visual thinkers like me, why don't you look at these two signals over here and here? And if I put my new signal right about here, uh, my drag version, how much have I dragged it by? What is my value of t that I have dragged it by? So choices that you can have are t equals 0, t equals 0 0.4, it looks like, t equals minus 0 0.4. So why don't you, as a CYU, see which one of these t's most likely maps to this particular drag, right, this particular drag. OK, <clears throat> welcome back. Now, those of you who have a 
kind of visual mind, you may have seen that this right here is approximately, so I've taken this, the right edge of this function, uh, of this original signal, and I've sort of dragged it over to about, this is about 0 0.4. So right here, this is at about t equals 0 0.4, right? Because this is one and it's kind of a little bit less than, than one half. So here it's about 0 0.4. And in this case, it's positive. And you can just see why if you look at the two signals. If it doesn't make sense why it should be positive, then feel free to simply plug in, right? If I want to get this edge over to 0 0.4, feel free to plug in the right value of t minus tau that should get you there. Okay, so now I have dragged the signal by some amount where I'm now at t equals 0 0.4. And this function right here, this specific box in green, this box signal here, is not only just h of t minus tau, it's h of t minus tau if t equals 0.4. So this is really h, what's shown in the actual plot is h of 0 0.4 minus tau, okay? Just as an FYI. All right, so now we have already one half to battle. We have gotten x into, you know, we, we started with an x of t and an h of t. And then what we've done is we've con converted it, right? We started, and we started with h of t and x of t. And then the first thing we did was we converted to h of tau, x of tau. The x is done, so I, I need to just keep manipulating h, right? So then I did h of minus tau then I essentially had to drag h of t minus tau. So now with this and with this, we have the components into the integrand. And so all we need to do is multiply these two. So this is an actual multiplication. I'll draw that with an x, right? This is a times. So I'm actually gonna multiply these two. I'm gonna multiply them. And then I'm gonna, that's gonna be that pointwise integral. And then I'm gonna sum, sum over all t. So I know it's kind of a lot of information, so we'll just keep going through it by example. Okay, so what I need to do is I need to do the flip and drag for a lot of different drags. So here's a flip and drag where I'm all my, my drag uh, increment t is less than zero. So feel free to cover all this up for now. Let's not even look at these other things, but let's just look at what that means if t is less than zero. So if t is less than zero, then h, there, there, there are a lot of values of h of t minus tau. It could be here, right? It could be way out here. It could also be about here. So the dashed line here shows one particular h of t minus tau that I've drawn, right? For any t less than zero. So in this particular case, I've shown one configuration. And if I look at it, uh, t is less than zero here. What I can do is this is a specific value for which I can actually go ahead and compute that integral, right? Remember that integral, the key integral that, that drives us is y of t. Remember, we, that's what we want to calculate is going to be the integral from minus infinity to infinity of x of tau multiplied by h of t minus tau d tau. Now I'm gonna say that, let's say that t is less than zero. So y of t less than zero is gonna equal this integral for t less than zero. Now, if I look at it, h of t minus tau does not overlap with x of tau. So if I multiply these two, the result is always gonna be zero. Does that make sense? When you look at convolution and you drag it, you're looking at the common area while you're dragging it. In this particular case, if t is less than zero, then what happens is that my impulse response does not overlap with my signal. 
So in that case, if I compute the convolution integral when there's no overlap, that's simply going to be zero because when this has this, this signal has a value, the other signal is zero and vice versa. So we can see this on the bottom right. So right over here, what I'm showing is I'm showing the output. So this is the output of the system Y of T. This is the correct answer for the convolution of an impulse response like this box right here with this box right here. This is the correct answer. So if I look at the answer, if t is less than zero, I can see that this is all zero. Okay. So in this particular case, let us, what we'll do is we will erase this integral. And I will use sky blue to denote each regime. So in regimes where t is less than zero, we have no overlap. So what that means is x of tau h of t minus tau is going to equal zero and therefore the integral also equals zero right so this is the sky blue regime so the sky blue re regime at t less than zero is always going to be zero so i can actually represent that in my output as here this is the sky blue regime what is the next regime well, the sky blue regime extends as I keep dragging the signal to the right. Eventually, I'm going to reach a region where there's going to start to become overlap, right? I'm going to hit this point right here. When does this, when does this point occur? Well, this h of t is right over here when t is just about zero. Okay. So now we're in a regime change. So we're here into this regime. t is between zero and one. So t is between zero and one can be any type of drag from here, could be 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 here, and so on, right? It's any type of drag here. The dashed line here means it's one particular drag in that domain. So this regime is my red regime. Now I want to see my output in the red regime is between these two points, between 0 and 1. So what is my output going to be? Well, what I need to do is I need to actually calculate, once again, that integral. Right? Our integral is that magic integral that we really care about is y of t equals the integral x of tau h of t minus tau d tau. Right. So I need to calculate that integral while we are in this regime, this red regime. Well, if I look at it, we can sort of, what is an integral saying? The integral is just adding up the area that is computed between x and h, the common area, right? You're looking at sort of the common area that you have represented. So in this particular case, your area is going to be t, right? You're going to have this, the, the width here of common area is going to be equal to t. And the height of this, so is going to be two, okay? So I have t by 2 for the common area that we have of these two signals. So if I have t by 2, then my function here is going to be, the area is actually going to be 2t. So in this regime, this part here is actually a line with parametric expression 2t. All right, let's move on. Here I have essentially, let's say, a yellow regime here from 1 to 2. From 1 to 2, uh, the impulse response, the drag version, is fully enclosed within x of tau. So it's fully enclosed. 
So you can actually just directly compute the multiplication, right? Your area in this particular case, what is it going to equal? Well, it's going to equal the width here, which is one, okay, multiplied by two, okay, one by two. So if you have one by two, then this value is always going to equal two, no matter where this is, as long as it's fully enclosed. And once again, if you're ever confused, try to look at the integral here on the top left for why that's the case. So it should be clear that the integral, if h of t minus tau is fully enclosed, is always going to equal 2. So if the integral equals 2, every time this is fully enclosed, no matter what drag I have, I have a constant flat part here of amplitude 2. Now let's go to the next regime. Right, the next regime is from 2 to 3. And here, once again, I have partial overlap. I have partial overlap in this case. And this is very similar. It's symmetric, so it's very similar to the re red regime. Okay. And so my area is actually, once again, going to go down with a slope of 2. So I end up with something. Oops. So I end up with something like this. And now finally, let's go to the fourth regime. The fourth regime, let's use a green, is when t is greater than 3. Okay. These are our different regimes of dragging. So if t is greater than 3, then what's going to happen is that that's going to represent all the impulse response drags that have zero overlap with the original signal x of t. And remember, once again, that if you have zero overlap, then this is essentially the same as the first regime that we dealt with. If there's no overlap, then the integral is going to be zero. Convolution integral will be zero. And so this is the correct output of your convolution, which you compute using flip and drag. OK, so <clears throat> as you can see, this is clearly non-trivial. Uh, it's not like just having an asterisk and doing 3 times 4, where you have 12. This is, you have to kind of condition your mind to learn about a new type of mathematical operation. And so uh, let's try to see how we would do this in a more general sense, and then I'll give you some other example problems. Uh, basically, what you have to do is you take your impulse response, you flip it, and then you drag it, and you try to see what are the different regimes of dragging. Okay, that's kind of one way to look at it. So, you know, the first regime is when there's zero overlap. So that's the, that's the kind of the two things that get out of the way is I look at, okay, what is the zero overlap? What is the zero overlap? Okay, and then I set my signal to be zero here. So if I were to do that, then I would first fill in the blue regime and the green regime. So if I fill in the blue and green regime first, and on an exam, I'm not given the answer, right? So I actually have to fill in this answer. So this is not given to me. So everything in here is a question mark. But at least I know that the signal is non-zero in between these two termination points. And so the next thing that I do is I go and break down what are different regimes. What I often do is I often look at next, uh, uh, I start from one end, and then I drag the signal until it fully overlaps. And so as I drag the signal from across this regime, um, I define my next regime up until the drag time that I need for the signal to fully overlap, which in this case is one unit because the impulse response is of width one. Okay. So once I do that, I know that uh, if my signal is increasing over time in its overlap, right, as I keep dragging it from left to right, it's overlapping more and more and more with x. So as it overlaps more and more and more with x, you can see that the convolutional integral is simply going to increase. And so that's why we see an increase here. That's the logic behind it. Now, intuitively, the next thing that I do is I know that now I'm in the zone of full overlap. So whether I'm here or I'm here, it doesn't change the amount of overlap that my signal has. So now I simply know it's got to be a constant value. And then finally, you'll often see symmetry as I start to shift the signal to the right even more, right? I'm going to the other end of the signal. 
I'm dragging and dragging and dragging, and I'm starting to see increasingly less overlap until there is zero overlap between the purple box and my black signal here. So in the purple regime, I'm going to end up decreasing my convolution integral as I keep dragging the signal. And then finally, that decrease is going to be so much such that the signal no longer overlaps with the original, uh, uh, that the impulse response no longer overlaps with the original signal such that the output is going to be zero. And so that is, uh, in a nutshell, how one would approach this problem from the flip and, uh, flip and drag perspective. OK. Here are some examples that you can try. Uh, and I think we'll try some of them together just to really underscore the intuition. So the first, two, first example is very similar. It's, it's two boxcar functions uh, that are being convolved. Second example is uh, adds a, a little slight, slight twist where we have uh, two boxcars being convolved with one boxcar. Third example is uh, adds another twist where we have a Dirac. And fourth example is where we have another Dirac as the impulse response. Um, it may also uh, be good to just think about what these signals are saying, just intuitively. Uh, if I want to think about the gist, before I jump right into the math, the gist of this signal, this impulse response, having an impulse response like this means that if I give the system a stimulus, like a, a, a spike, then it's going to give an output that is kind of prolonged for a uh, half a second. So think about you know one system that would do this is I have a button on my keyboard, I hit the button with my finger, and then it plays a, a note for half a second. That would be an example of this kind of impulse response in the real world. Okay. So this uh, boxcar example is a very uh, simple and commonly seen impulse response in the real world, where I do a stimulus, and that stimulus lasts a little bit longer than I expected without any decay. OK, so now if I take x of t and convolve it. So let's just look at the first example here for the moment. So what would I do? So feel free to just ignore these, just ignore. So the first thing I would do, right, I have x of t and y of t, and now I'm in the time axis. So what I can do is I can just simply swap this to the tau axis. Let's just, because I don't have any other arguments like uh, like scaling or flipping right now. It's just x of t and h of t that have been given to me. Without any penalty, I can simply go and just change this to tau, change this to tau, change this to tau if I wanted to. Okay, So that's one way to think of it. So think of these signals as already being in x of tau, h of tau. So now, what is the first thing I do? If I have x of tau and I have h of tau, the first thing I want to do is I want to flip h about the y-axis. So I want to flip it about the y-axis. That gives me this version. Okay. And this is going to be h of minus tau. This equals h of t minus tau if t equals 0, right? Clearly. Or let's write this as h of 0 minus tau. So this equals t equals 0. Now, if I want to drag it, let's say the width of this box is 0.5. So I want to look at h of uh, t minus tau at t equals 0.5. Then I simply have to drag it here. right? This equals 0.5. And if I want to look at uh, h of t minus tau at t equals 1, then I simply drag it again. Okay. And this equals t equals 1. All right, so now if I look at my regimes, okay, the first regime is when t equals zero or t when t is less than zero. So let's draw our output. Our output here is going to be all the outputs. So here we have the y of t. And what does it equal? Well, we're going to have an axis. Clearly, we're going to have a time axis here. All right, so let's try to understand. Uh, when t is less than zero, what is y of t equal? Well, when t is t equals zero or less, that means that my signal 
doesn't actually overlap with x of t, right? That's this blue box here. The blue box and anything to the left of the blue box does not overlap with x of t, so it's simply zero. So I can simply just say that everything here is going to be zero. Now, when t equals 0 0.5, what's going to happen is I have full overlap. So that's going to be the maximum overlap. So let's calculate that. So if I look at uh, t equals 0 0.5, if I look at the overlap, that's going to be a rectangle with area of 0 0.5 and of height 1. Okay. So the area of that would simply be 1. Uh, 0 0.5 times 1 is, it'll be 1 half. Right? So I have, in this case, um, here I have 1, here I have 0.5. So when t equals 0.5, I'm going to be at 0.5. And when t is greater than 1, we're going to be in the purple regime. So this is t equals 1, right? So when t equals greater than 1, I'm going to be in the purple regime and any, anything to the right of the purple regime. So I'm actually going to be here I have 1, and everything here is going to be 0. So now I simply need to just fill in what my signal is going to look like uh, at these points right here. And it turns out that in the green regime, as I start overlapping up until I peak, I'm going to be going in with a constant slope and a constant slope like this. And that's what you'll end up seeing. And the way you can do that is you know that you have t, you have 0.5t as this equation, right? Because if you just visualize it, the overlap here, if I have another green box here, the overlap here is going to be about t, right? And the height would be 0.5. So therefore, uh, this equals 0.5t, and we see that's on the curve. Uh, and as we start reach the peak and we start uh, reducing the overlap, we're actually going to start decreasing. So that's the kind of signal that we have. All right, now let's apply that to these other methods. I'm going to do this a little bit quicker. As you start to become familiar with convolution, you'll see that intuitively you'll just have a good understanding of what the convolution is. So in this particular case, I can just, I'm just going to stare at the signal for a little bit. So I'm going to take this x of t and be convolving with this h of t. So what is that going to do? Well, um, x of t here has the same form here. Okay. So I'm going to expect an output that is very similar. I'm going to expect an output right here. I'm going to expect the same output. But then I, at, once I hit 1 here, I'm going to have uh, you know, some, some more output that's going to happen. So what's going to happen is I need to flip this and see when this impulse response is going to overlap here with this edge. Okay. And that's going to start happening at t equals 1. At t equals 1, I'm going to see another ramp increase and something like this. And this here, the height of this is 0 0.5. So this is 0. This is 1. And it's going to end at 2. So that's one way that we can calculate this. The next signal is also pretty easy to calculate. You'll see that this is a common theme. Boxcars and Dirac's are very easy to calculate convolutions for. You know that when two boxcars convolve, they're, you just know intuitively they're always going to be a triangle when, uh, as long as the boxes don't overlap. Uh, what would be a harder question, by the way, that you can try and challenge yourself with is instead of having x of t being like this with this nice space here, what if I had this? And the next box came earlier, a little bit earlier. So I don't have that nice gap. So that means that, that here, kind of if you look at it, we're just concatenating the outputs. I'm concatenating two copies of this. Uh, but this doesn't work if my inputs are close together, as we'll see in the bandwidth example in a few slides. In any case, uh, boxes are still pretty easy because you convolve them, you get triangles. Another one that's really easy is if you have a box convolved with a Dirac delta function. 
So here I have a box and I'm going to convolve it with a Dirac delta function. And quite frankly, um, if you think about it, what do you do? Well, the first thing you do is you go and uh, we write down our flip, right? So this one, when I flip it, I'm going to have minus one here. So I'm taking the impulse response here. I'm going to flip this around the, this axis, right? So think of it coming out of the page and sort of flipping around. And so the spike is now going to be at minus one. Okay. And this is for t equals zero. Now, if I have t equals one, then that's right here. And finally, if I have t equals two, that's gonna be actually, well, t equals two is gonna be right back on the spike. So t equals 1.5, let's put it right here. Okay. So these are different, uh, the flipped impulse response at different drags, drag of t zero, drag of t one, drag of t 1.5. And so if I look at uh, my, where this overlaps with my original signal, well, it, it overlaps with my original signal uh, what we need to have, have happen is that the spike has to be between 0 and 0 0.5, right? The spike has to be between 0 and 0 0.5. So in order for the spike to be between 0 and 0 0.5, then I'm kind of in between the, this regime, right? In between the green spike and the purple spike. So only when t equals 1 or t equals 1.5 will I overlap with my original signal. And once a Dirac overlaps, as we know from the sifting, it just takes on the original value, the sampling value of the original signal. So what this means is that the output is going to be 0, 0, 0. Here's 1. And I have my original signal. And it stops at 1.5. Okay. And the height here this time, the height, is one. Okay, now let's go to the last one. The last one is I'm convolving with two Dirac's. Uh, first of all, I want to see if you can notice a pattern here. If I convolve uh, my original signal, so if I convolve this with a spike, so if I take the original signal drawn over here and I convolve it with a spike, I've kind of done these intermediate steps where I did the flip and drag method. But to be honest, you don't actually need to do flip and drag if your uh, impulse response is a Dirac. You just sort of know that it's just a pattern that you'll see. You know, the first time you do it, do it with flip and drag a few times. But you'll see a pattern where if you convolve any signal with a Dirac, you get it back. And the signal is just placed where the Dirac was before. OK, so I had a Dirac at 1. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to place the left edge of the signal at 1. And that's it. So I think of convolution with the Dirac as pick and place, kind of. So in this case, uh, we can actually look at this from the pick and place method. So I have here a signal. I, you know, I have here my output t. So I'm going to pick and place this signal at 0 0.5. So now I'm going to have the original signal, x of t, it'll be placed now, instead of starting at zero, it's going to start at 0 0.5. And it's going to be like this. And the height of this is going to be one. Okay. Now I'm going to do a pick and place with this other Dirac. But remember, the Dirac has been scaled by about 0.5. So I'm going to do pick and place, and then I'm also going to downscale it. So this Dirac is located at 1.5. So I'm going to pick this signal up and put it to 1.5. And the height of this is now going to be 1 half. Okay. So the height of this is now at 0.5. OK, so these are some basic convolutions uh, that you should be familiar with. And we'll do a lot more practice problems in the homework uh, along the lines of convolution. When you are first learning, the typical way that we always teach, teach it, wherever, whichever university you're at, is flip and drag, and you just go through a lot of tedious examples of flip and drag. But soon you'll get this intuition, like you know that boxes convolve with boxes are going to be triangles. You know that uh, if I'm taking a uh, doing a convolution with a um, um, you know spikes, then I'm going to do pick and place. 
So these kind of patterns will start to become apparent. And just to give you a sense of patterns, you'll start to see these patterns in everyday uh, you know, life or research or whatever. But just as an example, uh, let's just do a pick and place uh, from neuroscience. Trying to add a page here. Okay. So in this particular case, So in this particular case, let's assume that we're going back to our neuroscience example where we're giving a stimulus. Let's say I'm giving a stimulus. Every one second, I'm giving a stimulus. Two seconds and so on. I'm giving a spike to a system of a neuron. This is my system, S, and it's got an impulse response that looks something like this. If you look at uh, synaptic uh, action potentials, Oftentimes it'll look like a voltage behavior that looks something like this. It's gonna spike and then you're gonna have a relaxation period. Okay. And this width here is like, let's say it's really short, like it's like a microsecond. So what's gonna happen is that you can actually just calculate what your output is gonna be. Your output is just gonna be, since I'm sending a spike, I'm actually gonna pick and place uh, this at every spike. Okay, one second, two second. Three seconds. Right, so that's an example of a typical shortcut. This is a very typical shortcut that you will have uh, sending a spike train as input to a system and seeing an output that comes out. Uh, you know, there's so many examples. Like, you just think of it, there's so many examples, like your heart beating. If you think of every heartbeat as a binary signal of zero, one for whether your heart is beating, you're going to have an output, which is your EKG reading. And you're going to look at the waveform of an individual beat, and that'll be your impulse response. Uh, so feel free to challenge your friends on uh, finding everyday uses of the basic signals and systems that we've talked about. Uh, along those lines, here's another example. This is an example of noisy communication. So here I have a signal with a bandwidth of 0 0.5 bits per second. And in this particular example, I have x and that goes into a system H, I have H of T, and then I get Y of T. And so this is X of T, this is Y of T, and what's gonna happen is I'm going to apply some uh, convolution to this. Now, you don't have to worry about it just yet, so if it doesn't make sense, don't worry, you'll, you'll get the hang of it as you do flip and drag, but those of you who do flip and drag for a while, you can see that what's happened here is the peaks have been delayed, right? So this rising edge has now somehow been sort of delayed and smoothened out. And we can actually look at graphically what the impulse response might look like. So the impulse response for this system might actually look just by eyeballing it, something like this. So if you go in a computer program and you take a square wave and you convolve it with a shifted Gaussian, you should end up with a signal like this. And in this particular case, um, so remember our bandwidth is 0.5 bits per second. So here I'm at zero, this is one, zero, one, one. And if I look, I have zero all the way here. Here I have one, zero, one. So my signal has kind of changed its uh, pattern, okay, thanks to convolution. Another example of noisy convolution where it really uh, plays a greater role is when I have a faster signal or a higher bit rate going in. So here I might have four bits per second and I have the same impulse response. So I might have, this is like zero, this is one, I guess this is zero here, two ones, zero, Another zero, one, and one, right? So I have an eight, um, you know, I'm sending uh, four bits per second or eight bits within two seconds. These are the values of my eight bits. And if I do that convolution with the same H of T that I mentioned, so this is H of T, I get this output, which unfortunately uh, does not look very a good, like a good representation of my comm signal, right? Here it's zero. It's kind of like one, one. So I've reduced my bit rate. 
And as you'll see, this can also be studied later in the class with frequency analysis. So all these concepts will come together. All right. Uh, I just want to touch on a couple of final topics. I know this lecture has been going on for a while, uh, so we'll end soon. But uh, one topic that really comes up is causal convol convolution. In a causal system, the impulse response is zero if t is negative. And you can just look at that based on your definition of convolution, intuition of convolution, as well as the definition of a causal system. We know that a causal system has to be zero uh, before time t equals, t equals zero, right? It has to be zero up until t equals zero. But if you have an impulse response that is defined when t is less than zero, think about the pick and place method. You're gonna end up having uh, a non, you know, you're gonna end up violating the causality. So it's always true that in a causal system, the impulse response is zero for some t less than zero. Now, um, in order for this to hold, if I look at a drag version of the impulse response, it turns out that the drag version also equals zero if tau is greater than t, right? This just follows from this equation here. So if the drag version is zero, anytime you know that the drag version is gonna be zero, you don't need to compute an integral over that because you know the integral is gonna be zero. So you can actually simplify the convolution integral from this form to this form. And if I look at this, in this expression here, you can see that this is causal. This is causal because only the past and present values of x of tau contribute to y of t. So uh, convolution also has some basic properties. We will discuss this more in the next lecture. Uh, but just like multiplication, you can think of, remember multiplication, three times four equals 12, four times three equals 12, right? Mul just like multiplication is commutative, so is convolution. If I take x convolved with h, or if I take h convolved with x, it's gonna be the same uh, output. So we'll review these properties in the next lecture. And until uh, that, please go ahead and feel free to practice your flip and drag. Thanks for your attention.